So today, we're going to be talking about something riveting. Permanent establishments, the tax trap of having employees and offices in other countries. This is a huge issue that I run across all the time when I'm talking to potential clients uh, about forming companies and managing their companies, especially when they're doing so in an international context. And it's something where I'm constantly advising my clients that they need to be careful of and mindful of the permanent establishment rules. But before we get into what permanent establishments are and why they matter and, and what the dangers uh, they pose are, a little bit of a disclaimer brought to you by me, a little cover your ass statement, which is that this video is being brought to you for educational purposes only. It is not to be construed as tax, legal, or any other kind of advice. If you need advice for your specific situation, hire a professional. We obviously are available to do that for you if you need help. Now let's get into it. So permanent establishments, what it is and why it matters. So a permanent establishment exists when an enterprise from one country has a fixed place of business or a dependent agent in another country. Now I'm going to get into exactly what a fixed place of business is and what a dependent agent is, but let's break this sentence down a little bit. So one thing that's important is I very intentionally use this word enterprise because an enterprise really encompasses any sort of profit generating activity or, or any kind of activity with a profit motive, right? So this doesn't necessarily need to be a corporation. It could be a sole proprietorship. It could be a partnership. It could be any sort of enterprise with a profit motive. And so when it has a fixed place of business or a dependent agent, outside of its home country, it could be considered to have a permanent establishment in the other country. So I'll give you an example. Let's say we have a US corporation that has an office in Germany. That office may be considered a permanent establishment in Germany. It depends on several factors. Or let's say it has an employee in Germany. That could create a permanent establishment. And the reason why that's so important is when a permanent establishment exists, that enterprise is going to be subject to tax in that country where the permanent establishment exists. So going back to my example, if you have a U.S. company that has an office or an employee or something in Germany and you have a permanent establishment there, that U.S. company is going to be liable for taxes in Germany on the profits allocable to that permanent establishment. We'll talk a little bit about that later, but right now I want to talk about what is a fixed place of business. And as you can imagine, it's somewhat straightforward, right? It's a place of management. So this is a place of control, right? And I mean, if, if you think about a company, for example, with just one director, if that director is managing that company's affairs from within a foreign country, it could very well have a permanent establishment in that country. So, you know, take for example a US LLC with a sole manager, and that manager lives and works and manages that company from Germany. Most likely, that LLC is going to have a permanent establishment in Germany, it's going to be liable for tax there. So, a branch or office. And this doesn't necessarily need to be a dedicated office, right? I mean, this could even be a home office, it could be. Uh, a co-working space, it just has to be a place that's available to the business or to the enterprise when it's there conducting its business. Uh, a factory or a workshop could also be permanent establishments. And then, you know, mines, gas wells, oil, things like that would also usually be permanent establishments. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on those because the ones where people usually get caught up is this place of management or having a branch or office in another country. So like I was saying, you know, to create a permanent establishment in another country, it could be as little as just having a director managing that company's affairs from another country or having some sort of office available and boom, you have a permanent establishment, you're liable for tax. Now the other thing that can create a permanent establishment is a dependent agent. And so that then begs the question, of course, what is a dependent agent? And the short answer is 
someone who is not an independent agent. So we have to figure out what an independent agent is and everything else is going to be a dependent agent. So an independent agent is usually an agent that's in business for itself. So let's say for example, you're a US company that sells phone cases in Germany, for example, and you engage with a local business that sells all kinds of phone accessories for different kinds of companies all over the world. Well, that's going to be an independent agent, right? Because they're going to be selling phone accessories regardless of whether or not they're selling your phone cases, right? And it's, it's its own independent business. It's in the business of selling these phone accessories and you're just one more client on their platform, right? It's one more product that they can sell and distribute. That's going to be an, an independent agent most likely because it's an independent operation, right? They're engaged in their own profit motive. They're not engaged in a profit motive exclusively for your enterprise. Now, in contrast to that, let's say rather than engaging, you know, some company that's in the business of selling phone accessories in Germany, you just engage with some guy in Germany who is going to go out and sell the phone cases for your US company, right? And he has the ability to conclude the sales contracts. You have the ability to tell him what to do and direct his activities. He's using company equipment, so on and so forth. Most likely the German government is going to view that person as a dependent agent and whatever profits he's generating in Germany are going to be subject to tax there because of that permanent establishment that he created. So an independent agent is basically a business in and of itself. And if you're contracting with an independent agent, you're probably not going to have a permanent establishment in the country where that independent agent is. But if it's not an independent agent, then most likely it is a dependent agent. Uh, the independent, the dependent agent doesn't necessarily need to be an employee, right? So it doesn't matter what you call this person. I mean, it could be somebody who's working on commissions. It could be somebody who you intended to be an independent contractor, but it doesn't necessarily change the fact that it could still create a permanent establishment. And it can be an individual or a company, right? So if, for example, you had this sales agent that was selling the phone cases and rather than you paying him directly, your enterprise says, Hey, why don't you form a German company and we'll pay your German company for the, the sales that you do for us. We'll pay it a commission. And your U S company is really like the sole client of this German company. Probably it's going to be looked at as a dependent agent and your U S company is going to be subject to tax in Germany. Now, uh, another, now the agent acting on behalf of the company, if they have the authority to conclude contracts on behalf of the company and they're doing so habitually in that other country, that's generally going to create a permanent establishment. So there's two ways to create a permanent establishment in another country. One is through the fixed place of business, which is generally going to be a place of management or an office. Uh, and the other is through a dependent agent. And generally, like I said, it doesn't have to be an employee. It can even be a company. If it's not an independent agent, it's a dependent agent. And if they have the authority to conclude contracts on behalf of, of your company and they're doing so habitually in this other country, you probably have a permanent establishment on your hands. Now, if the country where this purported permanent establishment is, has a tax treaty with your home country. So going back to my example, a U.S. company that has a place of management or um, you know some activities, let's not say a place of management, let's say a U.S. company that has some activities in Germany. If there's a tax treaty between Germany and the U.S., which there is, then there's some specific exclusions to what a permanent establishment is, right? So the use of a facility solely for the purpose of storage, display, and delivery of goods or merchandise owned by the corporation, right? So I don't know, maybe it's a, a sales center or, or a warehouse or something like that. Maintenance of a stock of goods or merchandise belonging to the enterprise solely for the purposes of storage, display, or delivery, right? So this is like a warehouse. 
Maintenance of a stock of goods or merchandise belonging to the enterprise for the sole purpose of processing by another enterprise. So maybe you make parts that a company in Germany is going to use and process, right? And so, or, or raw materials or something that are going to get processed. Um, maintenance of a fixed place of business solely for the purpose of purchasing goods or merchandise or collecting information from an enterprise, right? So it's if, if it's so, so basically, you know, looking at all of these examples, they're all sort of ancillary, right? These aren't necessarily things that are generating profit. These are sort of ancillary things to the main business. And because of the tax treaty, these things would not create a permanent establishment, even though there is a fixed place of business and potentially even employees in that foreign country. But this is some pretty complex stuff. I just wanted to put this up to explain that there, there are some exceptions to these permanent establishment rules with tax treaties and that you know if you're thinking about doing some cross-border business, you definitely want to see if a tax treaty existed between your home country and the country where you're planning on doing some business and see how that impacts this permanent establishment. So the dangers of a permanent establishment are that they're really easily formed, right? I mean, it's, for example, I live in Dubai and I have my company here. Now, if I decided to move to Spain, for example, and I'm sitting in Spain and, and managing my company that's in Dubai from Spain, Spain's going to say, hey, buddy, you have a place of management here. We're going to tax you. Um, and so you can really inadvertently create a permanent establishment without even really thinking about it. And this is this is especially dangerous with the place of management and the dependent agents because a lot of times I see companies they're like, oh, well, we're just trying to look at this market and so we're going to engage this guy there as an independent contractor, but he's going to work exclusively for us doing this. Well, probably this guy is going to be a dependent agent, right? And so you're going to have a permanent establishment. And so the big danger of the permanent establishment is that they're very easily formed. It can be done inadvertently. You're not required to like go register anything in that country. It's just if you meet this threshold of a fixed place of business or a dependent agent, boom, you have a permanent establishment. And if you haven't, if you're not properly reporting and paying tax on the profits allocable to that permanent establishment, then you got potentially have big problems on your hands with the country where that permanent establishment is. Now, the thing that's a real pain in the ass with permanent establishments is you have to apportion the income, right? So if you have a U.S. company with a permanent establishment in Germany, part of the income is going to be allocable to the U.S., right? And part of the expenses are going to be allocable to the U.S. And part of the income and part of the expenses are going to be allocable to Germany. So you're going to have to apportion these income and expenses and say, okay, this is what is reportable in the U.S., this is what's reportable in Germany. And that's not always super easy to do, right? Um, because there can be some ambiguities in what gets allocated where, and each country is normally fighting for a bigger share of the profit so they can tax it. So permanent establishments are definitely not my favorite way uh, to operate because one, there's a lot of ambiguity as to when a permanent establishment is created. Uh, you have these cross-border tax issues with the apportionment, potential disputes between governments of who gets to tax what. You get stuck in the middle and potentially wind up with double tax. A lot of times, it's a lot more preferable if you want to do business in Germany, have your U.S. company set up a subsidiary in Germany and employ the staff in Germany and clearly allocate the duties and responsibilities between the two companies so you don't wind up with your German company also, in addition to being a subsidiary, being a permanent establishment of your US company. So this is just some complex stuff that I think people really need to be aware of because I get consultations all the time where I'm talking to people and they're like a director of a company in one country, but they live in a totally different country and are managing the affairs from there. And I'm like, yo dude, you have a permanent establishment problem that you need to get sorted out because your company's subject to tax in the country where you're managing the company's affairs from. So I hope that this has shed some light on what permanent establishments are, why they're so important and why they're so dangerous. 
If you need some help doing some permanent establishment planning or you have some questions about it, shoot us an email or give us a call. We can definitely help you out. Peace out until the next video.